Kevin, there's a, a couple of questions here about uh, who, who gets regulated and, and who, who uh, needs to comply with the various regulations of, of under AB 32. Um, and I'm wondering if you could elaborate a little bit about who the regulated entities are expected to be in the current plan. Um, you know, specifically, there's a question from uh, uh, building owners uh, who aren't necessarily in control of the space they lease and, and, and a question about how much they will be uh, responsible for compliance. Yeah, and for that, I'll start with the cap-and-trade program itself. And for the cap-and-trade program, the people who are directly being regulated would be the large industrial sources, um, things like uh, cement plants, uh, refineries, power plants. And then as we get into the second phase of the program, we would be looking at including transportation fuels and natural gas that's being used by everyone, but regulating at the point of distribution of the fuel. So it would be the distribution utilities for natural gas or the uh, refineries or the distribution uh, racks for the transportation fuel. What that will mean as we move into that second phase is that there will be something of a price on carbon put on transportation fuels and natural gas that will affect building oil. But, you know, a business operator that you know, has relatively low direct emissions, wouldn't be directly regulated. Um, would see, you know, some very small increment in, in the energy prices that you're paying. So there's an indirect effect. And so one of the things that we are looking at is in terms of the energy efficiency, we think that there are opportunities to design the program to reach out to the small businesses and the, and the building owners both to be able to find opportunities to reduce energy use so that the bills end up lower, even if the rates end up a little bit higher. And then for a lot of the other measures, it depends on the nature of the measure. Um, one that I think has, was going down a path that would have touched a lot of people was looking at commercial uh, refrigeration. Um, and as the regulatory development has been moving on that, what the staff here at ARB has been trying to do is find a way to get the most cost-effective reduction and to get as much of the environmental benefit while regulating the smallest number of entities, um, you know, in terms of who would be touched by the regulation. So in individual regulations, it will sort of play out in the context of working through the details of the regulation, who gets touched by the regulation and, and who does not. Thank you, Kevin. There's a question here about the economic analysis that was presented and, uh, and questioning whether uh, it's the peer review that's happened for it has poked any holes in it and, and what we expect to see in, in, in future analysis. And, and Jamie, I wonder if you could comment on that. Yeah, I'd be happy to comment on that. Um, yeah, there's, there's a couple of things to keep in mind. Uh, you know, CARB, CARB used the, the best practices when it did its economic analysis. Some recent work has come out um, suggesting much greater economic impacts to the state of California as a result of AB 32. And that analysis looks at only compliance costs and doesn't consider any of the economic benefits such as avoided energy use. Um, CARB's analysis did in correctly include these net, um, included these benefits so that it came out with a net benefit calculation. And it did so using the best practices. A lot of the peer review criticism of CARB's work was really holding up CARB's modeling um, analyses to an ideal that hasn't been done anywhere by anyone. And so in that sense, um, it's kind of easy to criticize most any modeling study. CARB did as well as any other modeling study. It's been corroborated by other use. They've used best, best practices in terms of sensitivity analysis. Nevertheless, CARB's work, like any modeling analysis of, of, of environmental policy, has limitations. So for example, one of its limitations, as I mentioned earlier, and I see a question about it, is that the, the, the analysis did not include the costs of the worst effects of climate change. And what we're doing with AB 32 is endeavoring to reduce the likelihood of bearing those costs. We can't guarantee we won't bear those costs, but certainly we can more confidently say we're going to be facing those costs if California does not take action and nor does the rest of the nation and the rest of the world. Of, of course, they can continue to improve their analyses. And um, Kevin, I, I think I speak for you when I say you're, you're 
working on that on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, we'll That's be getting right. new results, and, um, and Kevin, if you, I think we're pretty much out of time, so if you want to say a last word or two on that issue. Yeah, actually, I have one more question for you, Kevin, uh, regarding this. Uh, uh, the question has come up in conversation around AB 32. You know, why is it important that California uh, uh, lead on this? Um, I wonder if you could comment on the, on, on the effects of California's actions on the global stage. Yeah, and this is something that California by taking the lead it has really helped over the course of the last five years change the nature of the debate in the country. And clearly, the new administration in Washington, D.C. means that what's going on at the federal level is very different than it was a year ago. But in California, we still see a role for California and other progressive states to play in pushing the envelope, making sure that there's an opportunity to test out some of the ideas and work through the details of how you might make these reductions in a way that will help inform the discussions at the national level in Washington, D.C., and also at the international level as we look to Copenhagen and a possible new international agreement. So um, leadership at the state and regional level, we think, continues to play a very important role in making sure that um, we take aggressive action to address what is a very serious environmental problem. Well, <clears throat> that's the time for today. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Jamie, for those terrific presentations. There were many questions that went unanswered today, and we're going to be glad to follow up personally with those. So um, stay tuned for that for anybody who asked one. To learn about Environmental Defense Fund and its mission, visit www.edf.org. For more information about AB 32, and California Air Resources Board, go to www.arb.ca.gov. Thank you everyone for attending. We'll see you next time.